when you've got a matchbox and you had to light that match, if you went slowly like that, you'd never light the match. Light the match! And we wait. Paddy, hello? Paddy Upton, welcome to the Sports Illustrated Show on Loud Radio. How are you today, my friend? I'm very good. How are you doing? All good, thanks. I'm uh, in studio with uh, Skulk Yonker and Gareth Ross Lee from Sports Illustrated. Uh, just wanted to catch up with you ahead of the, the Tour to Australia, but also just to you know, have a chat around you and, and where you've taken your career. Because, I mean, the, your, your repertoire is endless. You've got two master's degrees, one in sports science and then one in executive coaching. Um, and, I mean, you came to the four in 94 nine to 98 as the fitness coach for the Proteas, and then you decide to go and retread yourself as a... As a as a coach or a psychologist, for want of a better word. Yes, yes. How did that come about? What uh, brought that on? Well, the, towards the end of that four-year stint from 94 to 98, I, um, I started experiencing within myself what I can only describe as a sort of creeping emptiness. You know, the job was fantastic. I was a young guy, well-paid, traveling the world, meeting the Queen and Mandela and sitting in the best seats of the house at not only cricket but all sorts of sporting tournaments. But there was something for me, uh, there was an emptiness, um, something missing. And in a way, I, when I reflect on it now, it was sort of, I, I found myself, I was really playing in the playground of the ego, sort of living the outwardly superficial and really cool life. Um, that was sort of part of me moving on. But the other thing is when I looked at the team and the talent within the team then and the skills, I really felt the team was under-delivering on their potential, both in an individual perspective and a, and a team capacity. And to me, there was something missing. Um, and I guess that really, when I left there, I didn't know what that something missing was, but I became very aware of this, this void. Um, and I guess through a couple of things that I did, and eventually then coming and stumbling across executive coaching and coming to learn in business, what are some of the leading businesses doing to bring the best out, in, out of individuals and teams? I started to, dis- to discover then what that something missing was. Okay. There, and I mean, the, you've taken it to a level where you've, you've got your Paddy Ups and coaching, and then you're also a co-founder of the Performance Zone with Gary Kirsten and Dale Williams. And I mean, your leadership and performance coaching, you're a keynote speaker. I know you, you were talking last night because I saw a couple of tweets from guys that, uh, that got a lot out of last night's talk. <laughs> um, and then the, you end up as the as the mental conditioning coach for the Indians for the last four years and end up as one of a handful of South Africans with a World Cup winner's medal in cricket. In fact, you're the only Weinberg boy to have won a World Cup cricket medal. <laughs> um, yeah. The, and, and then the, but, and, and you also write on these things as well. I mean, it's, it's quite interesting you talk about what you were saying in terms of yourself and the ego. Um, I, I, I caught up on your blog on, uh, in the Shadows of the Limelight, that three-part series that you wrote about the superstardom in, in cricket and things like that. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it's, it's quite a different take in terms of the sporting world. And um, the, a lot of people have been singing your plaudits, uh, including, um, oh, what's his name from the Sports Science Institute? I've lost it. Noakes. Um, there we go, Tim Noakes. Um, are there many other guys going down the road that you're going down in terms of mental conditioning and, and training sports um, teams and stars yes, that way? I want to just rewind a bit. Is when I studied my executive coaching back in 2003, I came across some research that suggested that coaching in sport lags a decade behind um, contemporary leadership and performance philosophy, Yeah, which I found it quite interesting. And my research looked at what is the approach that all uh, professional cricket coaches in South Africa over a 14-year period, so that's the provincial and international coaches, what was their approach? And I compared it to what players wanted from their coach. And I, I spoke to you know, a number of the senior most players through all, through all the provinces. And there was a very clear and statistically significant gap between what coaches were offering and what players were wanting. And what players were wanting was fairly close to what is happening out there in some of the leading businesses um, in the world. Okay. And that really sparked my interest and showed that there's a really exciting opportunity for a cricket team to move ahead of the rest of the world. Um, and at, at the time, I suggested that I think all cricket teams worldwide, professional teams, are lagging just 10 to 15 years behind. Um, and I just see more and more evidence as we go. But still, I went to a conference in London last week with sort of some of the prominent leaders in from all different 
sport, team sports from across the from across the world. And even then, they were still focusing on science and technology and innovation and statistics and real time feedback and all the inputs from the world of science and sports science. Yeah. Now, up till maybe five, eight years ago, sports science made significant contributions to the improvement of performance. But what happened up until that period, now all the people who are bringing these advances, um, competitive advantages to various teams and individuals, they've all set up businesses now and made their technology widely available to everyone. With the advent of the internet, um, anyone can find anything about strategy or video analysis. If you've got some money, you can get the, the best video analyst or technology or whatever it may be. So it's no longer providing a competitive advantage. Yeah. And what's happening is coaches are still tend to be focusing on the science of performance rather than on the performer and the individual. Um, and, you know, one, one stat that for me really illustrates how important it is to focus on the individual and not the science of the preparation is at the previous Olympics, um, an athlete would expect to, who has a successful Olympics, will at least meet their season's best for that season in whatever their event. Now, there were 10,960 athletes, and something like only 21% of them met or better their season's best. Wow. And all of them would have been using all sorts of fancy technology and science and periodization and rest and whatever it is they were using to prepare them to be in peak condition and ready for their Olympic event. Yeah. And yet 79% never de even delivered on their season's best would, would suggest that there is something else that is holding individuals back. Yeah, well, it's, uh, um, and that is, you know, the, the performing under pressure. Um, it is a coach. How is a coach helping an individual to learn and think for themselves? In very few sports environments, is there a learning environment that exists that really allows individuals to grow, make their own decisions, make mistakes, grow as people? And the research from business and my research certainly from nine years ago in sports suggested that we need to be growing people, not developing performers. Yeah, and I mean that seems um, to be the... And that really, and that remains the, I, I honestly believe that the, the future innovation, what's going to really bring the next wave of innovation and increase of performance to the, the majority of sports, particularly team sports, is going to be the way the coach manages and creates the environment, the type of performance environment that is created within the team, which Science cannot really help that much with. That is an art of man management. And in business, same thing. You know, the art of man management is now becoming more important than having fancy strategies. Yeah. Like, I mean, it seems to be a general trend in society across all spheres, really, that it's about getting the best out of people rather than driving the best results, Yeah. for want of a better and, word. And, and that, that change overcame, I would say, within between five to ten years ago. But what's happened is coaches and employers are continuing to look to science and strategy to deliver um, the innovations because prior to that, that's what they were doing. So we, we, we're all stuck in looking in that space. And as I said, there was no better example in this, this conference in London that, in fact, the, um, the current England rugby coach, uh, what's his name? Could Lancaster. He? Stuart Lancaster. He, he opened up the conference and he spoke about that he, he obviously inherited a, uh, an England team that it was, it was an all-time low results-wise and public scandal-wise. And he spoke about how, for him, it was more important to build a culture before the strategy. And as the culture was developed, the strategy would naturally follow. And then for the rest of the two days, everyone was talking about strategy and science and innovation. And every time they did it, they referred back to, yeah, but what Stuart said about culture, that is the most important thing. But we're still not looking at that. Okay. So there's a wonderful opportunity that sits there, and I guess that's really my my interest and why I'm you know wanting to write and share and talk, uh, just share this information for the benefit of everyone from school kids who 15 years ago, 20 years ago, well, when I was at school, the master told me what to do, told me how to do it, when to practice. I was never encouraged to think for myself. I was encouraged to follow his instructions. So I never really got to learn a whole lot. I never really got to fully individuate and find my own strengths and find my own flair. And then, you know, when I went to university, I was told what to do my, by my lecturers and coach. And then the first one or two places I went to work, you know, I had this manager who was deciding what I should do and giving me the instruction. And we now know that that is certainly not the approach to get the best out of individuals. That's, you know, yesterday's management philosophy, the instruction-based philosophy. 
No, absolutely. And I mean, it seems to be working because you've, you've now been part of two squads of, of cricketers that have reached the pinnacle in terms of test cricket anyway. Um, and obviously it's early days in, in the Proteus setup, but they seem to be going in the right direction. Um, you guys are off again now on the, uh, on the weekend for, I think you're, yes. you're in Oz for five weeks for a three test series. That's correct. Uh, that that one's shaping up to be quite interesting, just in terms of the fast bowling battle and and the the batsman stars. I mean, I see Ricky Ponting scored 160 odd in the Sheffield Shield yesterday after an 85, so he seems to be hitting a, a decent run of form ahead of it. Um, you guys looking forward to getting down to Oz and b- before coming home and and spending four months essentially back in South Africa with series against New Zealand and Pakistan? Yeah, I mean, this this, this really is a big one for us, as England was a really big test series and our preparation was really significant for that um, and I think emotionally physically and emotionally and, and mentally that really took a lot out of the guys yeah. but what we saw there was the players were really able to step up to the plate and there was a real maturity that well the, the maturity of the team was already there but it's really gone to the next level um, and I guess this is really another a test now of the, the players maturity and their, their metal under pressure well, certainly the, the test side, I think, is slightly more uh, sort of a more, more solid, grounded um, team. I guess they've been together a lot longer than the, 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 the one day and the T20 side, so it could stand to reason. But there really is a, a, a cricket and a personal maturity that is just developing and evolving within the test side. So, you know, obviously we go there with a lot of confidence, but when you go into Australia's backyard, um, the heat is going to be on from ball one till the, till the last ball is bowled for all three test matches. No, absolutely. I mean, it, as fans, we can't wait. It's the you know, it's always nice to play England, but I think as South Africans, it's it's all about that Aussie versus South Africa clash. Uh, yeah. And and the, that that last series the, at the end of last year, I think it was yes, when they were over here. I mean, that was yes. just phenomenal to watch as a fan. So looking forward yes. to it. Uh, Paddy Skolk here. Um, I just wanted to, we, uh, we did quite a big uh, preview on this Aussie series uh, in our November yeah. issue that's just out. And basically the angle of that feature is, uh, you know, maybe not so much the players and the, and the, and the coaching staff, uh, but like uh, we as fans might be taking the Australians a bit lightly for this series. Um, uh, do, you think, do you think we have a point there if we think, you know, they're not you know, really the team they were uh, say three, four years ago. Do you th- um, I know you know the Proteas won't take. Uh, you know, there's no such thing as an easy match. But uh, just in terms of uh, public expectations, do you think we might be giving um, uh, the Aussies not uh, you know the, uh, too little credit? Um, listen, I th- the, the reality is the current Australian team is not what they were five, six years ago. Yeah. Um, however the brand of Australian cricket, the toughness of Australian cricket, the pride in Australian cricket is no different. They they will not go away. If they're under pressure, they're not going to back down. So there is going to be no game or no moment where they're handing something over to us. Um, and it would be at our peril if we were to take them in any way at all lightly. Um, and again, I think the maturity that is developing within the national team is that we really focus on doing our processes exceptionally well. So whether we play a slightly lesser or a slightly better team, that we need to be delivering really consistently on our processes. Um, but if somebody, uh, so certainly I don't, I sincerely hope and we won't set it up that any of the players um, will take this lightly in any way. And I, and I certainly know the players aren't. Um, maybe some of the public are because they don't see Warren and McGrath and War. Um, and those real, real key players that that were thrown on our side for probably a decade's worth of cricket. Yeah. The, um, but it definitely is a different yeah. side. You know, even the energy of the Australian side that we've noticed is it's through that decade where they had those that that really phenomenal team. They were um, they would always sort of put across this really bravado um, front. Um, they weren't very in general. They gen- they weren't very friendly. They weren't very engaging in team hotels, etc. Um, but I think that it was very easy to put on that real tough bravado um, front when they were doing so well. And once they lost those players, they continued to try and put on that front, but it was brittle. 
And I think what they've seen, and which has been interesting for me to watch, is that to a degree they've dropped that because they've realised it's not, it, it's actually brittle. It's not what it was. So the current Australian team is fascinating for me is they're actually quite friendly, they're quite engaging, they're quite open. Um, which, yeah, it's been really interesting just to watch that real turnabout and whether it's because they're not being led by Ponting who was, you know, such a tough guy and whether it's the fact that they don't have those real tough guys you know, if they abused us on the field 10 years ago, they had firepower and skill to back it up. Yeah. Um, they don't necessarily have the firepower and the skill to back up their on-field abuse and the banter today. Um, so it's definitely an evolving and a changing team, but a team that you take lightly at your peril. And certainly in their backyard, um, we'd be foolish to do that, which we will not do. Uh, Paddy, it's Gareth here. Um, I just recently heard some... some uh, quotes that were attributed to you, to you from a recent talk and it was just quite interesting to hear about um, looking back at the T20 World Cup and some of the, the, the reasons for maybe that Pakistan game but also just saying about uh, looking forward at selection maybe especially in that form of the game that that, that you guys are looking at a completely new way of, of, of picking guys and, and, of, and of finding guys tuning them up to, to play that form of the game. Um, would you like to elaborate on, on that? Well, I wouldn't say it's a completely new way. It's just, you know, again, that there is... We don't understand the T20 game. I don't think anyone understands it really, really well. I think there's so much we're going to come to learn about the game in time. You know, I think a lot of people in the cricket world four or five years ago took it as a real, just a real hit and giggle and a, you know, a nice marketing version of the game. But it's actually the, it's the highest pressure version of the game. And we're starting to see more and more that it's not just a hit and giggle swing. If you hit it, great. If you miss it and you're out or someone else comes out and swings. There's incredible pressure and incredible skill that is required to succeed in that form of the game. Sure. Um, and those are two slightly different concepts. If, you know, you, we have, and in every team, you have people who are highly skilled. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're really good under pressure in the, the real pressure moments. They might have a little bit of self-doubt, slightly lack confidence, they might have fear, have a fear of failure rather than, than a mindset of pursuing success in that high pressure moment, which is a very normal thing. You know, bowler gets hit for two fours, the first two balls of the over. He's going to fear being hit in the third ball to the boundary. Yeah. Whereas you want the guy who's actually got the mindset about, I'm going to run up, I'm going to nail a Yorker, and I'm going to get him, give this guy one and get him off strike. So the one mindset is, I hope he doesn't hit me for four. The other mindset is, I'm going to make sure he gets one and get him off strike. One is preventing failure, one is pursuing success. And so, we really, I, I think it's more and more being shown that in that form of the game, you want guys who really back themselves, who really mentally um, up for those big, pre- those, those big moments, even if they're slightly less skilled. Um, you know, maybe there is, there, there is an argument for saying, well, let's, let's rather play that guy who's up for the big moment, even if his skill is slightly less than, than another player who we could have, picked to either bat or bowl in that situation. Excellent. Yeah. Yes. Excellent. And we, we saw that uh, a wonderful example of that was in the, uh, in the World Cup final in 2011. You know, Yuvraj Singh had been an unbelievable form throughout the tournament. I think he got a hundred and a whole lot of fifties and he ended up winning man of the series. But in the high pressure of that final, when we were 18 for two, Yuvraj was in to bat five and Dhoni to bat six. Now, Dhoni hadn't scored a 50 in international cricket for nearly five months, and he had had a very poor tournament, uh, World Cup tournament. But when the real pressure was on in the final, Dhoni knocked on the window and got Gary's attention, and he said, I want to bat next. So he put himself as captain ahead of the guy who was obviously going to get man of the series and was in form, and Dhoni walked out of the man who was not in form at all. But he was the man for that real high-pressure situation, possibly more so than what UV might have been at that time. That's, so that's just a wonderful example of, you know, the obvious thing was to have the guy in form go out and bat. Yeah, the, I mean, that, that's a lovely little bit of inside information. Paddy, it's been awesome to chat to you. The, I just wanted to find out from you before we let you go, um, what is the Sissy Hangshaw's Pan Galactic Goggle Blaster Tour all about? Oh, my goodness. I don't think this is a forum to talk about that. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> It's a fancy dress mystery hitchhiking pub crawl uh, around the Cape Peninsula. So just along the lines of No Bars Hold from the 90s. My brother's done it a few times. Yeah, you pitch up yeah, in, a, in a team yeah. of two in full fancy dress regalia. We take your watch, wallet, cell phone and car keys. We give you a next pub sign and it's a mystery tour where you hitchhike from pub to pub 
in fancy dress clothing. And it's been such a hit here in Cape Town. A mate of mine staying to Durban. They're in about their tenth year. We had about twelve in Cape Town. It's just um, it's madness for the sake of madness. When's because the? I think sometimes we can get too serious about life for ourselves. Absolutely. So when's the next one, buddy? Day. When's the next when's one? The next next one? Year? Uh, it'll be early, early in the new year, probably February, March. We haven't okay. decided the exact date yet. Well, I'm going to keep, uh, I'll keep tabs on that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we'll enter a loud radio team for the hell of it. Uh, Paddy Upton, Beautiful. it's been it's been awesome chatting to you. Um, all our best uh, to you and the and the Proteas down under, and then uh, we look forward to seeing you guys back here in in December to take on the the Kiwis. Cheers, guys. Thanks very much. Nice chatting to you, and thanks very much for the opportunity to share on on the radio station. Thanks very much, Betty. Pleasure, Patty. Enjoy the rest right, of the day. All the best, guys. Well, cheers, bye. Come on.